I'm going to start reading at verse 21. The key verse that we're going to focus on today is verse 26. Tell me, you who desire to be under the law, do not listen to the law. For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by a slave woman and one by a free woman. But the son of the slave was born according to the flesh, while the son of the free woman was born through promise. Now this may be interpreted allegorically. These women are two covenants. One is from Mount Sinai, bearing children for slavery. She is Hagar. Now Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. She corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. But the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. Now you brothers, like Isaac, are children of promise. But just as at that time, he who was born according to the flesh persecuted him who was born according to the Spirit, so also it is now. But what does the Scripture say? Cast out the slave woman and her son, for the son of the slave woman shall not inherit with the son of the free woman. So, brothers, we are not children of the slave, but of the free woman. So, Paul here is taking an Old Testament story and he's kind of making a comparison or an illustration or an allegory of what is currently going on for the church in Galatia. So, he takes two women, two mothers. We have Hagar and we have Sarah here. And he kind of compares them. Hagar was a slave. Sarah was free. Hagar was a, a slave to Abraham and Sarah, particularly Sarah's slave at that time in Genesis. But Sarah was free, and she was the wife of Abraham. Hagar bore Ishmael by fleshly initiative. If you know this story, you know that Sarah was promised a child, even though she was close to 90. And God had promised this child, but uh, it wasn't happening as soon as they would like. And so they, this, they did what was common back then. Sarah said to Abraham, well, maybe, maybe God intends that uh, you have, or I have my child through my, my slave, my maid servant here. So I'm going to give you my maidservant as a wife so then I can have a child that way, which was a common thing back then. So it was a, a fleshly idea. There's no way that I could have a child at 90, so it must be that God wants it this way. So Ishmael was born through Hagar. But a little later, Sarah conceived and had a son, and his name was Isaac. So Sarah bore Isaac by God's promise. It wasn't by some sort of human idea. Hagar had Ishmael, and he was born from human plans and human ideas. But Isaac was born because God made a promise, and God keeps his promises, even if they're not in our timeline. Now, back then, when you're a slave and you give birth, that child is automatically a slave. That's kind of how it was in the ancient world. If slaves give birth to slaves. So Hagar having a child, that child is a slave. And correspondingly, so forth. So any children born to Hagar would be slaves. Sarah, her children are free. Because she is not in slavery, the children that are born to her are free children. So corresponding to the people of Galatia, being a slave means you have to follow a bunch of laws to win God's approval. You have to earn your salvation by a bunch of works. Whereas free means that you follow Christ by the Spirit and that you show gratitude for your salvation that you've already attained. It's not something that you earn. You show gratitude for it already. 
And so this is, this is the main lesson of Galatians, and this is what Paul is trying to get across to them. Hagar stands for Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai is where uh, Moses received the law from God, the Ten Commandments and, and all of the other laws. Mount Sinai is where he received them. So Hagar stands for law, being enslaved to law to try to earn God's favor. Sarah, although it's not specified here, Sarah would stand for Mount Calvary, where Christ died for our sins and took them away so that we are not in slavery. As it says in one scripture, you are not your own, you are bought at a price. So we are no longer enslaved. We call God our Father. Not just Lord, but Father. Hagar corresponds to the earthly Jerusalem. And that means at this time, there was a temple there. And the law required that certain sacrifices had to be made. You know, some each day and then on special holidays, a bunch more. And you had to do those sacrifices so that your sins would be taken away. So it was almost like you had to jump through all these hoops so that your sins would be taken away. So Hagar stands for that. that that's part of slavery, earthly Jerusalem. Sarah stands for a heavenly Jerusalem, one that is not here. A heavenly Jerusalem. In Revelation 21, it says, I, this is like, when all is said and done, I saw the new Jerusalem descending out of heaven, dressed as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And the heavenly Jerusalem doesn't need to offer sacrifices day in and day out to be saved, to be clean before the Lord. There's one sacrifice on Mount Calvary that took all of our sins away. One and done. And Sarah stands for the heavenly Jerusalem. Now, after Isaac was born, if you know the story, the son Ishmael started persecuting the freeborn son, Isaac. And so, because in, in such a way that um, from what I read, Sarah was actually afraid for Isaac's life. Because Isaac, if he grows up, then he inherits the estate. If Ishmael gets rid of Isaac, then Ishmael inherits the whole estate. And so, Hagar and Ishmael were sent away. The persecuting was the persecuted. So Sarah and Isaac were being persecuted. And it says it is the same now. Because people who follow laws jump through hoops to earn things. They sort of feel like everybody should do that. Whenever, whenever there's any hoops to jump through and things to accomplish, we, we tend to think others should do the same. So that was the situation in Galatia, and Paul's using that Old Testament story to apply to that. There's a lot of parallels here, is what he's saying. But there's one, there's one phrase here in verse 26 that says, the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. She is our mother. This story, this Old Testament story, applies to us. This is not just somebody else's story. This is our story because we are the people of God. They were the people of God. And so we are spiritually one with all of these people. Galatians 3.29. If you have your Bibles open, why don't you turn to that? I like this verse. I have it memorized in the old version, so I've got to read it out of the new one. It says, And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to promise. So, this Sarah lineage, spiritually, is us. In Christ, all believers are promised children of Abraham. So, if you believe, if you have the faith of Abraham, then you are a child of Abraham. And when Abraham as that story goes, looked up into the sky and God said, so shall your offspring be. If you can count all these stars, this is how many kids you are going to have. If you believe and have the faith of Abraham, then you have one star up there in that sky that Abraham saw. 
So, these stories are not just for somebody else. These are our stories too. So we have biological mothers who give us birth, but we have spiritual mothers who raise us. Sometimes those mothers are one and the same, but not necessarily. You can give birth, and that's one thing, but it's quite another thing to raise a child into maturity. That's a whole different ballgame. And there's a lot of investment that it takes to raise a child, as many of you know. I'm looking out there and I see a lot of people who know much more than I do what that entails. It takes a lot to raise a child into maturity. Verse 27, I'll read it one more time. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. Oops, excuse me, that's chapter 3. Verse 27, For it is written, Rejoice, O barren one who does not bear. Break forth and cry aloud, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate one will be more than those of the one who has a husband. In other words, Sarah, even though she was barren, she had a child by promise, by God's promise. You and I, most of us are Gentiles. We are not biologically descended from Abraham, and yet by God's promise, we are his children. We are raised and brought into maturity by, not by biology, but by the Spirit, but by God's promise. If you look in the Bible, your true family is not the ones that birthed you, but the ones that raised and nurtured you. That's, that's your true family. If you know the story of Ruth, then you know that Ruth married Boaz and had Obed. And even though Ruth gave birth to Obed, Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, was said to have a son. It says in Ruth 4, 16 and 17, Then Naomi took the child and laid him on her lap and became his nurse. Naomi raised this child. And the woman of the neighborhood gave him a name, saying, A son has been born to Naomi. Naomi didn't give birth to him, but she raised him. And they called this child hers. In Isaiah 53, it talks about Christ as the suffering servant. It talks about the, the suffering that he's going to have on the cross. And when you read it, it's pretty unmistakable that it's talking about Jesus. But it says that Christ has offspring. Isaiah 53.10 Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring. Jesus didn't have any children, but he has offspring. At church, we belong here. We belong to a church. Not because of biology, but because of adoption. We don't belong to the people of God because of biology. We belong because of adoption. The same reason why Christ has offspring and Naomi was called a mother. And the same reason why the barren one here can rejoice. Because more are the children of the one who has never born than of the one who has We tend to think of family as just a biological, genetic thing. God doesn't see family that way. God sees family as a matter of adoption, of belief, of faith, of God's promise and the Spirit. We don't belong here at church because of biology. We belong because of adoption. The church is our mother because of God's promise. God promised 
and we belong here because of that. Gentiles are not biologically of Abraham, but we are of Abraham by a promise. God promised Abraham a descendant that would bless the world, and his name was Jesus Christ. And if you belong to Jesus, then you are part of that promise, and the church is your mother, the heavenly Jerusalem. There's a lot of motherly characteristics of the church. For example, she provides a home for our faith. If you believe and if you have faith and you go out into this world, you often feel like a stranger, like you don't belong, like you're weird and you're strange. In some places you go out into the world and you're persecuted. You might lose your job. You might get kicked out of your house. You might be killed. But at church, you're at home. If you're a believer, you are at home here, you belong here. We all have one Lord, one faith, one baptism. In 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 7, Paul says to the church in Thessalonica, We were gentle among you, like a nursing mother caring of her own children. So we have a home here. Faith is blessed by family. If you have a believing family, then that's a blessing to your faith. That's great. A faith is blessed by family, but it needs church. Faith connected to a church can survive an unbelieving family, but not very well vice versa. Faith that just has A biological family has very weak prospects for the future. There's a family that I know that was a homeschooling family. And um, they decided that they didn't want to belong to any church. They didn't find any churches that they liked. And so they decided that they were just going to have church together as a family. And so basically just their biological family was their church. And so they kind of had their own services on Sunday morning. And then mom got cancer. And mom was convinced that God was going to save her. And so she says, I'm I'm going to be saved. I'm going to be delivered. I'm going to get healed from this cancer. And she didn't. And the family kind of broke apart after that. They didn't have a church to ground them in faith. And so, none of them go to church anymore. They don't have church together as a family anymore. And there's kind of question as whether they even believe it at all anymore. Faith is blessed by a family, but it needs the church. The church feeds us with true teaching. When you're part of the church, you're connected to all the believers around the world and all the believers that go all the way back into history. And so, as times change and there's new winds and ideas of teachings and that sort of thing that come around, you're not going to get swept away by that because you're going to be attached to what has always been taught all the way since the beginning. There's a continuity there. It, the church grounds us in the truth. Ephesians 4 talks about this. He gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain unity of the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may lo- no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. So we're attached to the church to ground us in truth when the world blows this way and that way, one truth and another truth and one idea to another. Church keeps us grounded. The church nourishes us with sacraments. If you look at our doctrinal standards of this church. We believe that sacraments are not just some ritual, some habit that we do, but it actually spiritually nourishes us. 
in ways that we can't even understand. That we call it a sacrament. We believe that God actually works through this. This is not just something that we do. There's something that truly works in us when we partake of it. Look at the uh, screen here with me. It is by faith alone that we share in Christ and all His blessings. Where then does that faith come from? The Holy Spirit produces it in our hearts by the preaching of the Holy Gospel and confirms it through our use of the Holy Sacraments. So, I mean, just look at this. Look at the front of the church here for a minute. See, it says, The Spirit produces faith in our hearts by preaching and the sacraments. If you look up here, the way that this church is set up, you get to Christ and understand Him by preaching and the sacraments. And all of these draw us to Christ. So when I'm preaching the Word, Christ. When we administer sacraments, Christ. And it's He that nourishes our souls unto salvation and maturity. So the church nourishes us spiritually with sacraments. She raises us into maturity. So just like moms do, they teach us right and wrong, and they train us to do the right. Now just like real moms, they are not perfect in doing this. But this is the function of, of the church. John Calvin, if you know who he is, a famous theologian, he says, he puts it this way, the church into whose bosom God is pleased to gather his sons, not only that they may be nourished by her help and ministry as long as they are infants and children, but also that they may be guided by her motherly care until they mature and at last reach the goal of faith. For those to whom he is father, the church may also be mother. The function of the church is a spiritual mother to us. And she shows us what Christian love is. Family, when you're, when you're born into a family, you kinda, there's a natural love that goes there. And so no matter which family you're born into or which, which time, there's kind of a natural, a natural love there. But the church, you are, at the church you are loved by people who are otherwise strangers, people who you don't know. And for example, um, when a group of us went to Mexico a few years back now, um, Mike Kaler and I stayed with one family. You remember that? <clears throat> we, they, they bent over backwards to make us feel at home, to make us feel welcomed, and to give us uh, all, all the comforts that we needed. Um, we stayed the night there. I still remember waking up the next morning and they said, what would you like to drink for breakfast? And... I remember thinking, well, I don't want to trouble her. What might she have? So I just said orange juice, and Mike said the same. And immediately she bolted out the front door to run to the corner store to get us orange juice to drink. That kind of hospitality. It's just amazing that when you go to another country and they find out that you're a believer, that you're a Christian, you go... From stranger to family, all of a sudden. And that's Christian love. A love that is beyond genes, biology. It's a love that is of Christ. Because we are family. She is our connection to Christ. The church is. Our faith is built up by the preaching and the sacraments. Christ is the head of the body. The Bible talks about it that way a lot. The church is the body and the members are, are the members of a body. So, Christ is the head, the church is the body, and each one of us as a part of the church are you know, individual fingers and such. 
in Ephesians 1.22, He put all things under His feet and gave Him, Christ, as head over all things to the church, which is His body, the fullness of Him who fills all in all. Colossians 1.18, And He is the head of the body, the church. So, we need to be attached to the church to be attached to Christ, because Christ is the head of the church. He's not just head of anybody. He's not head of the whole human race. He's head of the church. He rules the human race, but he is head of the church. And so, she is our connection to salvation itself. In John 15, 4 and 5, As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So, through the church, we are connected to salvation itself. In our doctrinal statements, it actually says that we believe that since this holy assembly and congregation is the gathering of those who are saved and that there is no salvation apart from it, we need to be attached to the body of believers to be attached to Christ's body, which is our salvation. No one ought to withdraw from it, content to be by himself regardless of his status or condition. We all need to belong to it. As infants and toddlers in faith, we need her to survive. All of you who have raised an infant or a toddler, you know how much they need you to survive for daily needs. They wouldn't last long without a mom or a parent to take care of them. Colossians 2, 18 and 19, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by sensuous mind, not holding fast to the head. In other words, people who are false teachers are disconnected from the head. From whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. We need the church to survive. There's a early church theologian who put it this way, no one can have God for his father who does not have the church for his mother. It was as possible to escape outside Noah's ark as it is to escape outside the church. We need Christ and therefore we need the church to survive in our faith spiritually. So on this day that we celebrate our earthly mothers, let's also remember that the church is our common spiritual mother with a love that is of promise and a love that is of Christ that is beyond biology and genes and genetics. This is a love that is from God. Let's remember the church as our mother today. And let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord, our God, our Father in heaven, we are thankful for your church, which serves, like a, serves us as a mother would, that nourishes our souls, that builds us up and encourages us in faith and gives us a home where we can dwell. So Lord, on this day where we celebrate our biological mothers, let's also help us to remember the mother and mothers even that raise us in faith and in our spirits. In Jesus' name, amen.